I now have the honor of uh, introducing today's speaker and our guide for the tour later, Rob Avis. Rob and his wife Michelle own and operate both Adaptive Habitat, a leading edge design firm for resilient homes, acreages and farms, and Verge Permaculture, a globally recognized award-winning education business. Rob and Michelle have over 20 years combined experience in project management, ecological design and sustainable technologies. As a popular lecturer, Rob has earned testimonials from best-selling author Toby Hemingway, farming superstar Joel Salatin, and leading designer consultant Jeff Lawton, among many others. I can personally attest to Rob's huge positive influence and informed, solutions-based approach, and Cultivate Cochrane is really, uh, really appreciative that he's thrown his support behind us and is lending us his time and his expertise today. So please welcome Rob Davis. Hey folks, uh, thanks for coming out today and uh, what a great day actually to do greenhouse tours. So um, I'm a mechanical engineer and permaculture designer and have been operating this company for just over 10 years now. And um, I love, I'm, I'm a complete nerd, I love thermal dynamics, and I love biology and so greenhouses was kind of a uh, match made in heaven for me. And um, I've been thinking a lot lately about climate change. Um, the conversations going on in my house right now are uh, pretty intense um, as all these new reports are coming out um, and I live by this, as an engineer we use a lot of models um, always when we're doing thermodynamic models, when we're modeling um, different systems because we have to try and understand how a system is going to respond uh, before we go and design and implement it. And so, given that I've spent so much time in complex thermodynamic models um, over my career, um, just, just one kind of interesting model that we worked on, we tried to d design a district solar heating system. No, we didn't try. We did design a district solar heating system for the town of Vulcan um, to completely heat the entire town using solar thermal and straw bale combustion. So basically using waste biomass and uh, solar thermal systems. Um, didn't end up getting built, um, but it was a hyper complex model and when we were in that model kind of mucking about with it small different changes in the in different parameters within the model would have vastly um, it could have vastly differing effects on the output of that model and so I quickly became accustomed to or um, aware of um, I think the guy's name was E.P. E. Boxer or um, I can't remember his first initials, but the last name is Box. He's a physicist. And he has this quote basically saying, all models are wrong, but some are useful. <laughs> and so when I think about greenhouses and I think about our current global context, um, we can talk about all sorts of things today. I've, I've got a limited amount of time, but um, one of the things that really interests me about greenhouses is that um, I guarantee you that all the climate models are wrong but they're still useful. And the projections from those models um, could be vastly worse than what they're predicting, and they might be what they're predicting, but they could also be better. We don't know. And the thing is, is that when we look at risk through the lens of engineering, um, we always have to measure the risks on both sides of the equation. And so in action, going into this, knowing that all models are wrong but some are useful, when we look at the worst possible case scenario, um, the thing that very few people are actually talking about with regards to climate change, um, is that the worst possible scenario is famine, global famine. And the same scale of famine that the Irish dealt with with the potato famine. And um, the downside of famine is pretty big. Um, and so if climate change is wrong and it ends up being way better and we end up spending a whole bunch of time building passive solar greenhouses and food forests and food hubs um, and climate change doesn't happen, awesome, we've just built community, we've got nutrient dense food, we know each other better, we've greened our cities up, we've reduced urban heat island effect, we've created rainwater harvesting systems. There's really no downside to creating that. But in the event that climate change is right, and it's worse than they've predicted, 
then this is essentially an insurance policy. And so these greenhouses have become very important to me in, and I've created cor a course around it um, specifically for that reason, because for the same reason that you buy life insurance or critical disability for yourself or your kids or uh, employment insurance or all of these things, nobody ever questions the economic return on investment on an insurance policy. And so I think about permaculture, I think about greenhouses, I think about low energy buildings, I think about uh, no toxicity in our building materials um, as insurance policies for the future. And so sometimes things have to make economic sense and sometimes we just have to think about them through a slightly different lens. And I want you guys to think about greenhouses today through that lens. You have a 98 frost free or 99 frost free days here, which doesn't give you a lot of time. I also, one of the things that I like to think about in terms of when I'm doing a design to grow food or create resilience, especially around the food scene, uh, one thing that I find is even more visceral than thinking about frost-free days is how many days or how many nights of the year can you sit out on a patio and drink beer in your ecosystem without putting on a sweater? <laughs> Calgary's like one or two. <laughs> so if you can't sit outside and have a beer without a sweater, for more than a couple of nights, you're gonna have massively stunted plant growth because the plants continue to grow in spite of the fact that there's no sun, <clears throat> if the temperature is right. And so greenhouses allow us to mimic ecosystems to push the envelope and allow us to get 130 or 150 or 200 frost-free days. There's gonna be some magic um, Pareto's principle associated with the creation of a greenhouse if we get the design right on the front end. So um, today I'm going to go through a series of concepts that you need to think about with regards to designing your passive solar greenhouse. I'm recording it so it'll be up on YouTube and I'll make sure that you guys, these guys get the link so they can send this out um, for you guys to watch it again because I'm going to go through a lot of stuff fairly quickly. Um, They'll also put a link to um, some additional materials that I'm going to give to them so you guys can further your uh, education. And I should mention that on my YouTube channel, I have professionally produced, um, well, I'll call it prosumer produced because I produced it and I'm not a pro yet, but uh, uh, case studies of greenhouses right across the country. And they're about 20 minutes long and they go through a ton of detail on how people use these ideas. These, people, these are people that have come through our programs to design their own greenhouses in different shapes and forms in order to achieve their objectives in a way that met their values and vision. So we're going to go through greenhouse design steps, site selection, aspect ratio, shape, foundation, knee wall, ventilation, glazing and light, insulation, thermal mass, and integrated design. Usually this takes me a little bit more than uh, 40 minutes to go through, so I'll try and be um, brief on them. Um, so goals are really important in greenhouse design and I get a lot of clients that come to me and say I want a greenhouse that will allow me to grow four seasons um, basically all year round and that is a reasonable goal it's an expensive goal um, but it's a reasonable goal and so that's going to inform the type of greenhouse that we're going to need and the equipment that we might require inside um, for you guys and even for Calgary I think a more realistic goal for this ecosystem is three season growing um, and we could talk a little bit about that a little bit later into the, um, the talk today. Um, but um, understanding how to delineate your goals is going to create an enormous amount of objectives with regards to how you design your passive solar greenhouse. So if your dream in life is to grow figs, then that one element can dictate what your minimum design temperature is going to be, how much light you require, how much insulation in the walls, what the ventilation is going to look like, what the irrigation is going to look like. So sometimes I find it's easier to think about your goal through the lens of what type of ecosystem are you trying to mimic. Is it a Mediterranean climate? Is it a subtropical climate? Is it a tropical climate? Or is it just an Okanagan climate? Like, do you just want to grow peach trees? And, and so when you think about the climate mimic that you're trying to create, it informs all of the components inside of the actual greenhouse. Does that make sense? Okay. And so that's why I've got all these plants here. We've got peaches and citrus and grapes um, and a uh, really neat greenhouse up there that if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about. So um, what I did actually was I created a design tool, which you can get. Um, and I'll give you guys information in the follow-up email. And this basically allows anybody to design a greenhouse that's not an engineer. Um, so all the stuff that I would normally do 
to design a greenhouse um, can be done very, very easily. And so literally, when we talk about our goal, what we do is we put in the USDA growing zone that we're trying to mimic. Okay, so when you find the plants that you want, those plants, one of the plants that you grow in your greenhouse is gonna be the most sensitive. Okay, and so as the USDA number grows higher, the minimum temperature of that ecosystem also goes higher. So Vancouver Island, for example, is a zo USDA zone eight, I believe. Um, and so that would dictate how cold it gets there. It might go to minus three or four for a couple of days and that's it. And so that dictates, it's kind of the limiting factor with regards to what plants grow there. So as soon as you know that, it instantly sets the minimum temperature threshold of your greenhouse, which is really important. Once you know that, then you can actually start to design how efficient the walls and the glazing needs to be in order to keep it there. And then this tool tells you what the back end fuel consumption is going to actually be, which will allow you to do some economic analysis with regards to if you want to optimize specific components in your greenhouse or you want to run for three seasons instead of four seasons. So we need a way of quickly trialing different orientations, insulations, combinations within our greenhouse to be able to determine if it's going to meet our objectives. Um, and there's a few other things that you've got to put into that sheet right now, which we're not going to talk about. So site selection is really important. And obviously you want to have, uh, if you're going to do passive solar, and I should just define what passive solar means, it usually means that you've got insulation on the east, west, and north walls of the greenhouse and glazing on the south side. Okay, and so this type of greenhouse is very well suited to our ecosystem because we've got enormous amounts of sun. We've got sun almost every day of the year, and even when we don't have sun, we've got very good diffuse radiation resources as well. And so designing greenhouses like they have down in Medicine Hat here doesn't really make sense. But do you, know, do you guys know why the Medicine Hat greenhouses are all glass and they're oriented in the opposite direction of what we're going to talk about? No ideas? So electricity is far more expensive than thermal energy by about an order of, uh, by about a factor of 10. Okay, so natural gas, when we burn natural gas for heat, it's very inexpensive, it's ostensibly free at $3 a gigajoule right now, and we'll never see natural gas that cheap ever again. That's a whole other kind of conversation, but natural gas will get more expensive in the coming years. Um, but electricity is about equivalent to about $30 a gigajoule. Okay, and we, t we talk about electricity and gas in different units, gigajoules versus kilowatt hours. But when we do a conversion across, um, electricity is about 10 times more expensive than natural gas. And so those greenhouses are glazed 100% because they don't want to, they want to put less artificial light in because artificial light costs more than artificial heat. However, we're in a very strange time of human history right now when energy is ostensibly free. Um, and, and just to kind of put that into perspective, one gigajoule is equivalent to 277 kilowatt hours and one kilowatt hour would run that laptop for 10 hours and in order to run that laptop for 10 hours it would take one Olympian on a spin bike like if I was up here I'd have to have about 10 people on spin bikes to operate that projector and that laptop in real time so one gigajoules 277 Olympians on spin bikes for 10 hours and so imagine you have a room full of these Olympians and they're all 277 of them, and at the end of the hour, you give them three dollars, and they have to split it amongst themselves. So, energy is very inexpensive. Which, if you have an, a, a future view of where energy is going to go, passive solar greenhouses make sense because as soon as natural gas becomes more expensive, or electricity becomes even more expensive than it is, um, growing food, hothouse tomatoes and green pe green um, peppers, in places like Medicine Hat, isn't going to make sense anymore. Um, and our diets will have to evolve with the way that, with, with the increasing cost of energy, which makes the case for growing it in your backyard using the resources that you've got available. So a lot of people get really caught up on orientation. Basically, if your greenhouse faces south within 45 degrees of south, you're good. However, the optimal uh, orientation is slightly to the east, okay, about 15 degrees to east, so 15 degrees south Sorry, 15 degrees east of south, if that makes sense. However, anything kind of east of south is optimal. And the reason that is, is um, your greenhouse tends to overheat in the afternoon, and it tends to be the coldest in the morning because it's been without sun for that period of time. So orienting it to the east is going to warm it up sooner in the morning, 
and it's going to reject some of the nighttime or uh, afternoon sun when it's most prone to overheat. So that's, that's the optimal orientation. The other thing that we talk about is aspect ratio. And anything basically from a 1 to 1 to a 1, one upwards, so 1 to 3, 1 to 4, 1 to 5 ratio towards south is kind of what you want to achieve. So we're trying to get a, a really large aperture towards the sun. Um, and so typically the conventional glass houses would have the opposite aspect ratio. So they'd be going north-south. So they'd have a 1 to 3 but going in the other direction. Um, and that's to optimize the sun as it comes overhead. Uh, we're trying to optimize for sun and thermal energy, which is why we orient it in this direction. That's why we have that kind of an aspect ratio. So we did case studies on all of these greenhouses. This is the one that we're going to end the tour with today. There's one in Canmore, which is really awesome. You can go see this. This is all on my YouTube channel, Verge Permaculture YouTube channel. This is in a greenhouse integrated into a passive solar building. So they actually wanted a subtropical space. And so they can walk outside of their kitchen into a subtropical garden, essentially. Um, this is uh, the greenhouse in Invermere. It's a 3,000 square foot, four season passive solar greenhouse, which is passively heated using earth uh, tubes, which we can talk about a little bit later. Um, and so these are kind of the three primary shapes that we're talking about here. Um, so this one would be the ground cell greenhouse. This used a conventional coop house or glass house um, butted onto uh, a kind of a custom made structure on the back end. So they basically took a standard greenhouse, didn't connect it together, split it in half, and then put it up against a custom structure. Um, this is literally a horse shelter. So if you want a really inexpensive greenhouse in your backyard, go to UFA, buy a horse shelter, glaze the south and the top, and then insulate the back and put this on footings, you've got yourself a passive solar greenhouse. Very, very simple. Um, and this actually is a greenhouse that these two guys are going to build, I hope. Um, and so uh, basically a structure, we're going to see a structure today, uh, whole services, which is the front end of this. Um, and then um, I designed this greenhouse with a kitchen and a root cellar underneath it um, to, and to kind of combine the best of all three of those systems, which if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about. In fact, I've got a YouTube video on that exact greenhouse also on my uh, YouTube channel. So orientation is really important, or shape is really important. We're trying to um, basically create um, a roof that will shed snow and enough height on the front on all of these that we can actually put a vent in without blocking it with snow. That's the basic kind of rule of thumb as well. Thank you.